Welcome everyone. This is Tip Talk, our new show on the CTE Teach channel in which we are answering uh, questions from CTE educators. And so I, I am Christopher McClung, your host and moderator for, for this episode. And I would love to introduce my fantastic um, panelists of, of CTE educators and administrators. And I'll go ahead and have them go around the horn and, and go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Donna Robinson. I'm the program manager for Colton District. I am David Allman. I'm a teacher on assignment community recruiter for the Colton Redlands Yucaipa ROP. Elena Hernandez, program manager overseeing Yucaipa Unified. Nice. So this has been such a different year for us. And because of that, we have some great questions from our teachers. Um, and and uh, these teachers, most of them are in their first or second year of teaching career technical education in their districts. And so um, we have some great questions that they've asked. So the first question I want to get to, and we'll just kind of go left to right on, on the questions we have, um, which is, the question is Fs. There is pressure from all sides to lower our F rate, but it is not possible when students do not turn anything in. Any ideas? Um, that's a really tough question. It's a really good question too, because the, the D and F rate has gone up substantially during distance learning. Um, so when I read that, my first thought is, is if, I, if I'm a teacher on a campus, particularly a new teacher, um, I'm going to work with my administrators. Um, I know that the campuses that I work with are adding lots of supports in terms of offering tutoring and um, uh, different interventions for students. You can't obviously compromise your integrity as a teacher and say, okay, I'm gonna give you a, a passing grade just because you have a pulse. Um, you have to have some kind of evidence, um, especially in able to, to defend this to, uh, to parents right now. Um, so I would say, you know, your student hasn't turned in anything. Um, here's my documentation of, of communications that I've reached out to them. I've offered them tutoring. I've let them know about tutoring that was going on on campus um, and just really work with your site administration because I promise you it's not just you right now that's, mm -hmm. that's dealing with this and, and there has to be a unified approach. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I've said that to the teachers who've asked me that question. I said, you, if you're going to give a lower grade, what is the story of, of why that is existing? You know, why, why do they have that grade? Yeah. So, yeah. And how do you back it up with documentation? So I always tell my teachers when when students rightfully deserve their F or their their D, um, we always have to be able to defend it. So you need that evidence to um, make sure that yes, you've got your your logs of when you contacted the student, when you reached out to a counselor, when you sent emails home, and that becomes a little bit more labor intensive, or a lot more labor intensive in distance learning. But as long as you have that evidence to show um, how we can defend that failing grade, then, um, then it's not on the teacher anymore. It's strictly on the student. So it's always good to document, always give. Um, it's not just documenting one time. You have to show that you've had a pattern of reaching out on a regular basis. And this is the end result of that. There was no contact. There was no... Um, uh, that the student never showed up, things like that. So um, definitely documentation and mm -hmm. can you defend the F? Yeah, for sure. And I would say this even goes for when we're not in distance learning. Um, I, when I was in the classroom, I had a book of yeah. that calendared what we did every day, but also any interactions I had with students that were disciplinary. Um, that way I had some evidence for that. Awesome, so question two, any tips for eliciting better office hour turnout? I like that someone's already suggested giving extra points for coming into office hours mm -hmm. and not necessarily a lot. And they even say it started, they started last week and it's worked out wonderfully. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that that helped a little. As we started talking today, I'm thinking to myself, possibly dangling some sort of carrot. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're promising a little bit more information or a, an extra little lesson in that office hour to entice people to come in or drop in. I know it's tough to get students to come to class and then probably even tougher to get them to come to office hours. Yeah. I had a conversation with a, a veteran teacher yesterday who said that um, 
you know, she, she kind of puts it, puts it on the students. Hey, make an appointment with me during office hours. And, um, and if it's, if, if the office hours are on a day where it's convenient for the student, cause they have different things going on. Maybe they're going to tutoring or something. Um, so she kind of had the students make an appointment with her. And I said, cause I'm hearing from my teachers that they're not getting a lot of turnout on office hours. And she's like, Oh no, I get students, you know, every week. I just, I, I meet with them on the day when they're available. So um, mm -hmm. that that seems to be working for her. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Incentives usually work, maybe not in all cases, but trying to say, yes, you'll get extra points, or I know that one of my teachers uses it as, you didn't turn in your assignment, so I expect to see you during my office hours. And that's a time for the teacher to talk to the students and then also an opportunity to gain back, you know, to turn in the assignment, get those points back, things like that. So it's almost um, assumed that these students are going to show up if they're not missing any, or if they're missing an assignment. So, yeah. and then the appointments, I have teachers uh, making appointments, which is always a good idea. So um, yeah, if you need to see me one-on-one, -on -one, um, make an appointment with me and that, that tends to be working well right now mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add maybe even communicating what what the purpose for the office hours like this is this is why i have them and this is what we'll do if you come in and and, and all of that awesome so this next question and i'm gonna try to see if i can combine these two together so one of the questions asked um about hands-on projects at home and elaine i know you had a teacher that did a fantastic hands-on home project and so this question is are you are you doing any projects that require materials from home? How are you handling going from a hands-on skills environment to distance learning? If teachers could share any resources they may have for projects in a distance learning environment. And coupled with that, another teacher asked, what do you do if students say they may not be able to do a project due to materials at home? How would they come up with an, uh, an assignment for them? So I guess part, part A is, is there anybody doing hands-on projects? And part B, if they don't have the materials at home, what would you do? So, yes. Yeah, so I think I read both of these and the first thing I come up with is, is choice. Um, you have to give students choice. If they cannot, if they don't have certain items at home, then there has to be an alternative assignment to, to um, making whatever the project is. And so one of my teachers, yes. So the alternative assignment was you, um, you had to take pictures, I guess, of, of you could change the ingredients or you could change um, the materials, but then you had to take pictures of you know, the beginning, the middle and the finished product. But there's gotta always be choice involved because you will have those students who don't have the certain items at home and, and how can they how can they substitute certain things? And I think that's where the magic happens sometimes is, okay, well, this is what you need to build. This is the end product. How you decide to do it, um, that's where the choice comes in. So that has to play a large role in what, student, what teachers are, are, are doing during distance learning um, because we don't know what's available at, for students at home and it's not equal for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, ex excellent, yeah, always giving student choice is great regardless of our delivery system, whether we're in a brick and mortar classroom or we're using um, distance learning. Um, my thoughts on this were, uh, you know, get with people, uh, get with your colleagues and find out if there's simulations that they can use. I know I found a, a welding simulation online that, that pretty much mirrors the simulator that we bought for the welding program that's in the classroom. My other thought on reading this is to put students in groups so if you have a student who doesn't have the resources, like I'm going to team three of you up. And um, as you have the resources, first of all, do a prediction. What is going to happen when we put these things together? Um, and then turn in a write-up about what actually happened and what you learned from it. So that maybe they're working together and, and, and creating a video of it. It's like so-and-so is going to do it, but you're going to record it and you're going to make the notes. So give them a role. Um, that and, and put them in groups, right? Awesome. So David, in our in our tip training yesterday, our teacher induction training yesterday, David did a scavenger hunt to where they just had to find 
stuff sporadically in their home or their classroom or wherever it was at. And it was tissue boxes and all sorts of stuff. And so what I think would be a cool way to even introduce a project like this is maybe you have them as a scavenger hunt, just go find the materials they might need. Yeah. Uh, and then you can see what they have and don't have. And then that way you can kind of can, can summarize or figure out what, what they can do. So that's great. So if you have a list of 10 things and they're able to come up with four of them, mm -hmm. you've kind of preloaded it and it's like, Oh, I can make it work with just those things. So, yeah. 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 Good idea. And if it's a game and they found everything, then you know they can't come back to you later and say, I don't have all of that anymore. I lost my one piece of bread. So <laughs> I ate it. <laughs> I think yeah. another important part to this too is having the teachers model what their expectations are for these types of hands-on projects. And maybe the teacher should or could come up with different versions. Mm -hmm. uh, is one version of, of this project. This is a second um, that did occur on my middle school level. And I was really excited to see that the teacher had um, made the finished product and said, these are my two examples. Um, you don't have to do these, but um, this is sort of what I'm looking for. And I think it's so important that teachers are modeling what the expectation is, because it's very difficult to hold students accountable for something that they have never done. So you mm -hmm. want me to do this, but you, you haven't shown me exactly what it looks like. So I yeah. think that's important too, is yeah. to make different versions of the project and, and so that if they don't have all the materials, at least they could come up with some some version of it. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and just to build on that, um, I had a teacher that taught uh, art of animation and you know he doesn't want to, you don't want, as a teacher, you want to grade 30 versions of the exact same thing. So he would just give them maybe two or three parameters for an assignment, like make a, make a figure that is walking and interacts by passing something to another character. And everybody did their own spin on it where there was two characters that were passing a ball back and forth, or someone was dancing with someone else, or someone was feeding a baby or something. So they accomplished the, the three things that the teacher came up with, but the students had the freedom and the choice to come up with their own spin on that. So I would mm -hmm. say, make it really, really simple mm -hmm. um, and let students get really creative of how they're gonna accomplish that. It's gonna make them think critically too. That's a great idea, yeah, Yeah. exactly. Um, Elena, do you mind sharing what your teacher did with their hands-on project? So the, the instrument. Yes, so the middle school students were studying the engineering design process and part of that was to um, the, the assignment was to uh, make an instrument, a homemade instrument, and it could be any instrument. And there was really no guidelines in terms of the instrument had to be this big or this small. And it could do anything and it can be made out of anything. And it was amazing to see what the students came up with using Tupperware, using rubber bands, using um, uh, beads in like a, um, a baby food jar and they covered the baby food jar some use balloons to cover things and that makes a certain sound. And then um, the teacher asked everybody to unmic and then everybody to play their instrument. And it was, it was beautiful. He wouldn't think that all that would, um, all that noise would be nice, but it was. And um, then she went through the process of asking each student to just show their instrument and then describe what the materials that they use to make their instrument. And um, it was really, really cool to see what students came up with at home. And then she made one out of a Pringles can. And then I can't remember what the other one was that she made. And um, it was it was a nice demonstration of this is, it does, yours doesn't have to look like this, but these are two examples of things that you could use around your house. So I thought that was really, really important. Yeah. That's so, great. Did they yeah. did she happen to record that? Because I think it'd be really great to, for people to see that. We have it recorded and it just so happened to be the um, her observation day. So um, oh, probably, amazing. probably chose that for a reason. And uh, but it was it was pretty like almost 100 percent perfect. If you had to deliver a lesson, this is what you would want it to look like. And it yeah. was. It was cool. It was really cool. Yeah. Please share that. I will. Share the link. Thank you. Yeah, I will. It will, and it also goes back to kind of what Donna was saying, which I think is neat. Is is she didn't say make this exact instrument using these exact materials. She said make an instrument 
go find the materials. And so right. that way you don't get trapped into, oh, my student doesn't have this, they don't have these rubber bands or whatever it may be. Um, the goal is that they can make an instrument and they design a product, um, but they get to choose how they go about doing it that way. Right, and I think this brings up another good point is this teacher started clearly with the end in mind. All she wanted, she knew her, the end result was an instrument and that's it. And so I think it's important to let all teachers know that you really need to decide and get clear on what the end product is or what is the end result because then you can just backwards map and go, I just want you to make a drum. I don't care how you make the drum. I'm not gonna tell you what it's made out of. I just want you, I, I know that I need you to make a drum. And so I think that if we start with, you know, the end result, it gets a little bit easier to figure out all those little components that come in all between. So yeah, exactly. that was, it was a nice demonstration of backwards mapping for sure. Yeah, definitely. All right, so another question, and David, I'll ask you this one. Time management, any suggestions to help support students practicing better time management? I think this could help with late work policies. You would have thought I wrote this question. Uh, <laughs> That's why I picked you. <laughs> a time management person, what? Oh. I struggled with this in the classroom as well too, when students okay. were, weren't as organized or planful as I was. And I can remember I would try and have students make a planning calendar for the month. Um, and in a time of distance learning, maybe you're trying to have them make one for the week or just what's going on, what do they have coming in front of them for the week and just help them with their planning. It is a challenge because I don't think students are as planful as maybe we become as adults and don't see all the things that they have to do. Uh, if you can help with having things planned out for them so they know what the whole week is gonna look like or a couple of weeks so they even know what they're looking forward to in your class, I think that helps as well too. Mm -hmm. um, good, very good. Anybody else? Any other, anybody else have other time management suggestions? You know, I'm, I'm really big on just making systems for myself. And, and this year I've just made one, the never ending spreadsheet with, um, it starts with a tab that has my daily tasks and I run through that and check off, I'll put a little M when I did it on Monday, I'll put a little T when I did it on Tuesday and so on and so forth. And then beyond that, I have just all these little tabs with all my meeting links are on one tab. So I don't have to go hunt for those anymore. It's just like, here's, here's all the meetings I have every week. Here's the links to those agendas. And so I, I and I keep adding on to it and adding on to it and is things become obsolete, you know, I move them away, but um, you have to find a system that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and gosh knows there's an awful lot of time management um, strategies out there. But also I would have, um, I would put the onus on the students and, and make it a project, come up with really sound time management strategies as a group, just like you create the, the class rules and have them buy into it. Um, come up with a time management one, 10 tips, you know, and as a class and have those in front of you and, and, and pick one that's going to work for you and commit to trying that for, for a week or for two weeks. And then let's report back on how did that work for you? What were some of the barriers? What are some of the successes? And just keep that time management piece in front of people. Yeah. And for students as well, too, they have a phone in their hands, probably most likely. It has a place where you can put notes in there. You can set mm -hmm. alarms yeah. and helping them understand the technology and utilizing the technology that they can't seem to put away or put down using it for good. It's not mm -hmm. just an entertainment center. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. Chris, I was going to say, cause the last line, you know, I think this could help with late work policies. I, I implore teachers to, to look at what, so what are your policies? Because if you're trying to mirror your late work policies for your brick and mortar in your distance learning, well, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So are your late work policies, um, are they made for distance learning? And do students need multiple opportunities to turn things in as they would in a college class where everything's due Sunday at 1159? Are there, do we have to start looking at what are your 
policies, because if they are exactly like your brick and mortar, that's probably not going to work. And you're going to battle always, well, why didn't you turn something in? So maybe we need to look at the policies that teachers are, are you know, deciding on in distance learning and, and are those the best ones that they could for the environment that we're currently teaching in. So I think that's important to have to address. Yep, which is a perfect segue into our last question, which is what are some effective options for handling late work? I've tried enforcing strict policies in the past, but I'm finding it doesn't improve how much work gets turned in on time. And as a result, students' grades suffer. Maybe some teachers could share some best practices for balancing flexibility while still maintaining the importance of due dates and organizational skills for students. So, yeah. I was definitely going to say flexibility. We mm -hmm. have, we've had to learn how to extend grace and favor to no end in distance learning. And now that grades are sticking, Yes, I think that there has to be um, some degree of flexibility, but at the end of the day, there has to be where, you know, it, I'm not taking anything past two weeks or, or something. Mm -hmm. it, it will just, that's all the teacher will be doing then is grading late work and, and that's not a good practice. So yes to flexibility because everybody's got their own things going on right now, but then you're gonna have to decide at what, at what point you're gonna cut that off. Um, does it help to get late work in? I'm not sure about that, but, and really being, um, I think sticking to that. Yeah, I said, it, you know, you had two weeks to get this in. And then if there's something, um, you know, personal issues that the teacher has to take into consideration with the student, then that's another thing. But um, yeah, this is a tough one, but yeah. uh, being flexible, yes. And then I would say cutting it off eventually. At yeah, some point. I, I would just, uh, piggyback this on the earlier question and use those office hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say, look, um, you, you, this assignment was due and you know, it's late. I want you to make an appointment with me during office hours. These are the two days I'm available. Pick one. Um, and let's talk about what your struggles are in getting this done. Let's walk, walk you through it and just make that time available. I'm not an advocate of, of penalizing students for late work where, um, Grades, great. The purpose of grades is to measure mastery of the skill, um, and not to be punitive. So when you say I'm docking you 50% if you turn it in late, you know, in the real world, I don't get docked if I turn in stuff late. I go to my boss and say, Hey, I know you want this on Friday, but I need till Tuesday. So I think it's important to teach that negotiation skill to staff. And they're like, Yeah, you know what? Actually, it's fine. Tuesday's good. Um, I'll look for, I, you know, I'll, I'll expect it then. So teaching them how to negotiate that, um, I was able to do that a lot in college too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you said that because one of the arguments I've heard about this is, is they don't accept late work because you can't do that in the real world. Like if you turn in something late to your boss, you don't just get as bad grade, you get fired. But I think the ultimate core of what this means is we need to teach them how to communicate. Like if you're struggling with something and you need to turn it in late or something happened or yeah. you understand it, ultimately the, the thing is you just need to communicate that to your instructor and right. they most likely will just be accommodating with whatever you have going on. Right. So. right. We had a teacher in TIP yesterday who didn't call them due dates, called them deadlines because in her industry, in her sector, in the working world, it's a job deadline. It's a work deadline and not a due date. Yeah. And yes. thought that was great to add the industry into the classroom. Yes. I also like the term um, the drop dead date because you know, like this is absolutely when we have to have it because the ship is sailing, whether you're on it or not. You yeah. know, and in the real world, yeah, you know, we had met and I had a business where you know the messengers that you're standing there at 4 30, you better have it completed, wrapped up, and ready to hand over to them. Yeah. They had to get on to the next stop. So yeah. Yeah. And that can work in your favor. So one of the most stressful things that my class would go through, which I love doing to them, was we had a deadline for a showcase every year. Yeah. Um, and I said, the audience is coming. You have to get your project done by this date because the audience is here to experience it. And that was a real world way of setting it up. Um, they couldn't turn it in late. And so it was stressful, but they got to feel that. But that was only like once or twice a year. It wasn't my entire class. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, if we see this happening and feel this happening, I think 
you as a teacher might have to kind of put an idea in your mind that, okay, it's due Friday, but I'm not going to get them on Friday. It might be the next Wednesday before these things start rolling in. Mm -hmm. And maybe that also determines how you're assigning it and when you're putting the deadline date on it. Yeah. Also for so long, we've talked about punitive. If it's not there on time, just in reading the question, what if we flip it the other way and there's a reward if it's early? There you right. go. There That's you go. Idea. Okay, yeah. I'll take a look at it if it's early and give you a chance to improve it if it needs improvement as well too. Mm -hmm. I think the big time frame probably came at the end of first quarter when a lot of stuff started rolling in, I'm guessing, and even CEO work as well too. And I think at some point, to save yourself a little, a little headache, a little heartache. There's a drop dead date, like you said, Donna, on when things will count for first quarter. You can yeah. still bring in the work, give me the work. It, I might just not get to it. It might be second quarter before that it affects the grade. Yeah. I always in the classroom, the students would turn something in. They're like, I'm turning this in. And well, it's a month late. So I get a month to grade it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and no, that didn't happen. And but I, I can't put it in the grade book immediately. It, yeah. Yeah. Take some take some time. Well, fantastic. Well, that was our last question. Oh, and speaking of deadlines, last one I meant to say was that is one of our band names was deadlines made to be pushed. And I was notorious and, and Elena can attest. I was notorious for getting in trouble with <laughs> with our former assistant superintendent because she says you're not going to meet your deadline that, and I would be working as hard as I could. And I'm like, I'm trying, I promise you. But, <laughs> and that's where we came up with the band name, Deadlines Made to be Pushed, along with that's Water it. Intrusion. Water <laughs> Intrusion. <laughs> Socially distanced. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Hamburger Robots. So maybe that's something we should publish, just all of our band names. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a true testament to the life that we do not have when all we do on the weekends is shoot texts back and forth about our new band names that we yeah. have for the list. Wait, uh, you guys text on the weekends? We yeah. do. Teaching yeah. memes. I'm, I'm, out yes. of life. I'm out having a life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And we're we'll come across the name and we're like, oh, this needs to be added to the band name list. And yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Mm. It's fun stuff. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being on this episode. Um, and I, yeah, I just love being able to answer these questions for everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you for listening. If those of you who hopefully uh, heard this, got some great ideas about this. And please feel free, you guys can reach out to us as well. You can follow us on Twitter at CTE underscore teach um, and just um, on our YouTube channel at CT Teach and Spotify and multiple places. So thank you for listening. And then we will see you again next time on our new show, Tip Talk. Bye. Yay. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.